you know, a lot of people are arguing that, uh, you know, this separation, I found, I've been learning about this separation of powers in the U.S. system. It's absolutely fascinating, but it isn't really working right. like it was supposed to work these days, right? No, I mean, to put it mildly, it's not, right? I mean, look, from my perspective here, I, I, I basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, back, a 180 of what I just said. I said none of the three branches are supreme. That's true. But if you kind of go back and read the U.S. Constitution, Article One establishes the Congress, and I'm, I'm a constitutional lawyer by training, so I, you know, I can do this with my eyes closed. Article One establishes the Congress, Article Two establishes the Executive Branch, Article Three establishes the Federal Judiciary. Now, it's true that our system, our very elaborate, well-designed system of checks and balances, of course, ensures that no th none of those three branches can reign supreme over the others, but it doesn't take a genius to kind of figure out that the founders did codify those three branches in the Constitution in relative intended order of power. So Article One is the Congress. Congress was definitely intended to be the most powerful. James Madison, the Federalist 45, has this wonderful line where he says, in Republican governance, lowercase r Republican governance, the legislative authority necessarily predominates. That's kind of just common sense. But at least over the past 100, 110 years, especially since the Woodrow Wilson administration in particular, there's been a huge, huge power grab from Article II, the executive branch, uh, kind of the formation of the administrative state, the entire alphabet soup bureaucracy, you know, the, the, the intelligence agency is obviously kind of like the quintessence of that taken to its logical conclusion. And then, of course, Article III of the judiciary, which Hamilton Federal 78 very clearly says is supposed to be the, quote, least dangerous of the three branches, especially over the past 50, 60 years in the Warren Court in particular in the middle of last century, has just totally engulfed and engorged its power. So we are very, very, very far away removed from the founder's conception of the separation of powers. That's no doubt true. No, and it, because people are, you know, basically, I keep hearing people talking about let people legislating from the bench, right? so to speak, right? But that, and then the, the argument is that basically Congress has absolved itself from creating meaningful legislation, hence, hence this is what ends up happening. So uh, one of the tensions going back to the time of the American founding was whether one of the three branches actually was able to wield ultimate authority over the other three or whether they truly were separate but equal effectively. Abraham Lincoln um, famously opposed the Dred Scott decision. Okay, The Dred Scott decision came out in 1857. The Lincoln-Douglas debates were 1858. Lincoln repeatedly condemned um, Chief Justice Roger Taney in the Dred Scott case. He said that he would not recognize the authority of that opinion beyond Dred Scott. And just super briefly, for the benefit of our audience, in case they don't know, what is the Dred Scott? The Dred Scott case is almost assuredly the worst case in United States Supreme Court history. I, I would argue even more destructive than, than Roe versus Wade. Thankfully, it was overturned much sooner than, than Roe has been. The Dred Scott case, basically, it, it, it was an egregiously racist opinion, for lack of a better term, that effectively said black Americans effectively are not Americans, are not citizens, can never be citizens, and said that slavery is, is mandated in the Western territories at the time, so overturning the Missouri Compromise as well. It was, it was really a monstrous opinion, um, just awful. So Lincoln basically said that he would not respect the authority of that, except that as it applied to the parties to the lawsuit. He comes out swinging for this in his first inaugural address, and that was kind of largely the consensus until a somewhat obscure, little-known case in 1958 called Cooper versus Aaron, where the court arrogated to itself the power to pronounce what the final binding, quote, law of the land is. The, the, very few people outside of like law school circles are familiar with this case. But really since then, since 1958, and really the Warren Court in particular, we as a society have just let it sink in, this notion that what the courts say is the final binding, exclusive, and authoritative adjudication on any kind of lawsuit. So for example, in like 2015, after the Obergefell um, same-sex marriage case here, people regularly discuss that case as the quote, law of the land. Well, it, it's actually really not. I mean, like the judicial power of which Article 3 of the Constitution speaks, strictly speaking, Lincoln got this right, only applies to the parties to the lawsuit here. So uh, it's, 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 it's a big misconception, but it's one that we kind of have imbibed, the legal academy, the legal profession, judges, they've all kind of accepted it. It's wrong as a theoretical matter. I think it's destructive as a matter of kind of lowercase r, Republican self-governance, and ultimately our sovereignty over our own destiny as a society. So it's very destructive, I think, but we have kind of imbibed this lie. But, but precedent and people accepting things is obviously, I mean, decisive in some cases, isn't it? Yeah. Totally. But the way to kind of, once a precedent in society, from my perspective, is is taken and you want to enact that as, let's 
called, again, like the quote-unquote law of the land. The way to do that, to go back to our you know, discussion a few minutes ago, is through Article 1, is through Congress, is to, is, is to legislate it, or the state legislatures, of course. But that is, that is the domain where the battle of public ideas is, is, is really best expressed. In the legislative chamber, the battle of ideas, obviously, in the intellectual volume of ideas is best expressed at, at Newsweek and, you know, Epoch Times. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, this, okay, so this is great. We, we are at the NatCon conference. I've actually found it, and I've learned so many things from so many people, including yourself, you know, who have this kind of rich, deep, I guess, you know, education in these in this conception of nationalism. And, you know, I, I was talking with Yoram uh, earlier on camera about this, that, that nationalism has taken on almost a pejorative connotation like it, or I mean it's been, that has been forced on it when you, we're talking about nationalism here it, it's almost like you have to kind of explain what you're talking about because right. the association of some significant part of society is not a positive one it's not because people ha people of all political stripes both kind of the liberal left and the liberal right I would argue have been very successful in kind of condemning Mussolini and obviously the Third Reich itself as examples of nationalism gone awry. I mean, look, I can think back to my to my own high school education. Okay, what do you learn? What was what was the cause of World War One in Europe? Hold aside World War Two for a second. The way that it's taught to most American students that World War One was caused by the excesses of arch fierce nationalism, taken to its logical conclusion there. But the way that Yoram defines nationalism, obviously, and he did this at greatest length in his 2018 book, The Virtue of Nationalism, is that nationalism is, from his perspective, in, in contradistinction, in contrast to, 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 the, to a theory of empire, to a theory of the, of the thirst, the need to forcibly export and ultimately conquer other civilizations and export your values here. But, you know, I didn't quote him in my speech here, but I, I guess I would argue to you, to you in the audience now, that is completely antithetical to actually the American tradition itself. You know, I think back to John Quincy Adams. In 1821, he had a very famous line here um, where he said, America does not go abroad in search of countries, in, sorry, in search of monsters to destroy. We are the proponent of the rights that we have espoused for all of humankind. We are the champion and vindicator only of our own. So it's that kind of humility that I think Yoram's getting at in his, in his conception of nationalism, and I think that's a profoundly conservative humility.